Okay. So welcome to the audiobooks uh, working group room. Uh, we are going to start with a panel and we have a number of uh, expert panelists today. Uh, I am going to be moderating. My name is Jessica Albert and uh, I'm the digital and art director at ECW Press, which is an indie press in Toronto, Canada. Uh, and I helped launch the audiobook program at ACW in 2016 until our audiobook uh, work was large enough to warrant its own department. Uh, and I also run our accessibility program and I'm still involved in the audio from an accessibility perspective and from a an metadata and distribution perspective. Uh, we have a great panel of experts, all of whom I've had the pleasure to work with in some way. Um, so I, I, it's just road riches here with these panelists. Uh, I'm going to have you all introduce yourselves and uh, I'd like to start with Wendy. Cool. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Wendy Reed. I am the Accessibility and Publishing Standards Lead at Rakuten Kobo. I uh, am also a chair of the Audiobooks Working Group and the EPUB Working Group of the W3C because I don't have spare time. Um, and I come to audiobooks from helping Kobo implement back several years ago now, but then also writing the, being the editor of the audiobook specification uh, and approaching it from a standards point of view. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, Danny, can you speak next? Hello, my name is Danny Ferris. I'm the accessibility developer with NELS and it is an honor to be with all of you today. I apologize to um, those of you uh, who were at the first session because you have more of me to listen to. I feel very bad for you, but thank you for coming nevertheless. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. And I'm gonna pass it to Leah next, please. Hi, uh, I'm Leah Kleinhems. I am the audiobook manager at ECW Press. I work with Jessica. Um, I head up the production part of um, making the audiobooks, which means I work on um, around 100 titles a year, and we try to make all of those accessible as we can. Thank you. And uh, can we hear from Robert next, please? Sure. Um, I'm Robert Gordon. I'm senior manager of audio publishing and business and business development with Beyond Print, which is a renamed version of CNIB Library, formerly known as Accessible Publishing. And we we produce uh, in the Daisy format 2.02, and we we do a lot of a lot of books a baseline about 600 a year. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. And lastly, we have Pamela. Hello, my name is Pamela Hart and I'm the audiobook recording projects coordinator for NELS. I'm actually fairly new to audiobooks. I have 20 years in audio as an audio engineer in various different fields, but audiobooks is like um, a new and happy uh, change for me. I do um, come from a big movement of or a work in social justice and that is uh, um, I see a lot of like wonderful nuances and intersections with creating audiobooks and so I'm, I'm loving bringing that into the production um, and the production work that I do with Nels. Thank you so much uh, everyone. Um, I'd like to get started right away because we only have 30 minutes uh, before we move on to the working session of the um, time slot. So I'm going to start uh, by asking Wendy, who you, if you were here yesterday, you may have heard her speak about the um, audiobook specification in her standards recap. And uh, I would love to ask you, Wendy, how the audiobook standard is impacting accessibility right now. Right now, uh, it's kind of, we're still in those like early days of seeing the audiobook specification get rolled out. The audiobook specification once implemented fully across um, publishers, distributors, and retailers, and reading listening systems. I haven't come up with a good word for that yet. Um, across the, the ecosystem, we're going to see increased um, accessibility across the board in, by ensuring that publishers and content creators of all kinds really are providing that information, the navigational information that the spec allows you to now finally incorporate um, things like transcripts or alternative format media directly in the file itself. 
um, there's a lot of promise to see increased accessibility for audiobooks beyond just seeing audiobooks as the audio alternative of a print book or a digital book. Um, so we're still early. There's a lot of We've seen some implementations, um, Google Play Books, for instance, uh, Calibrio Reader, Thorium, they all support the audiobooks format. And we also now have distributors that are starting to show interest like Vital Source. Um, but we just need to see more and more integration into the ecosystem. And as that happens, um, I'm really hoping that what we'll really see is the replacement of current in-market audiobooks with this new format so that from the user perspective, the change is pretty seamless. Um, and it's just an overall better experience. Thanks. Uh, it's I find the audiobook specification so exciting, uh, and I love to hear you talk about it. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on the specification? I know it's really when this is Wendy's kind of area, but if uh, if anyone has anything else before I move on, please speak up. Um, but if not. Uh, I'd like to throw the next question over to Leah, uh, who can speak from a publisher's perspective. Um, how are you as a publishing house uh, trying to build um, accessibility into your audiobooks? Right, so when we produce an audiobook um, with the intention of making it accessible, the first thing we want to do is an accessibility assessment. And this is something we do when we're making an ECW front list book into an audiobook or when we're producing something on behalf of another publisher. And what we've basically developed is a document that allows us to walk through step by step and check off all the things we're looking for that we need to adjust to make more accessible. And so what we do is we're looking for images, we're looking for charts, for graphs, footnotes, endnotes, anything like that, that either wouldn't be read in the same order that it's placed in the print book or we need to insert different text like descriptive text to make it accessible for readers of all kinds. And after creating this chart that basically lists everywhere there's something inaccessible or something that needs to change in the book, we then either do it ourselves or send it to the publisher depending on who's making the book. And we have them uh, literally remove those elements from the PDF and insert the descriptive text so that nothing can be missed along the way. And this allows the narrator when they go into the booth to read the book exactly um, out loud as you would experience it as a seeing reader. And so that the audiobook can be completely enjoyed and consumed in exactly the way that the print book would be. And we try to cover um, as everything within the book insofar as we are able. And that includes doing things like reading all the end notes and all the footnotes. Um, and all those other elements that people don't necessarily think of or don't think to include or haven't thought to include in the past when making audiobooks. And so that's typically how we approach accessibility. Um, it usually involves mostly a lot of prep work and a lot of just working with narrators to encourage them to be part of this important work and encourage them to be open to recording things like endnotes and footnotes and work citation. Uh, and, uh, but it's something that um, publishers are getting more and more used to. Um, it's becoming a more accepted part of audiobook production and it's something we're really passionate about continuing to do. And I mean, I know the answer to this, but just to clarify, you're doing this on behalf of multiple publishers, not just on behalf of ECW Press. So this, and you're working with trade publishers. So what are the types of, um, what are the types of books that other publishers are bringing to you right now um, it, to, to build these kind of features in? Right, so um, really we get brought all kinds of books. We work with publishers from all across Canada and, uh, and we work with them to implement these things. And we basically have a document that walks them through the multiple different options for how they can implement these changes. And that might include, so for example, if someone brings me um, a heavy nonfiction book that's a, a biography of someone's life and it includes copious footnotes um, and then we have to talk about, you know, are these are these citation footnotes or are these adding to the text? And so do we want to include them in line with the text or do we want to put them at the end of the chapter? Or do we want to put them at the end of the book? And so we might work with a publisher to do a nonfiction book like that. Um, also, there's literary fiction that includes elements. People don't always think about that. Sometimes in the text, they'll say something like, um, Bob drew a picture and then the author may have literally inserted a picture into that book. And so we have to think of a way to naturally include that um, while keeping to accessibility standards, but also making it flow in a way that doesn't interrupt or change the author's intent in that passage. 
Thank you. Uh, I'd love to throw the same question over to Danny. Uh, and it, if you could let us know what kind of features you're seeing um, built into audiobooks or not built into audiobooks right now. Sure. Uh, so one thing that I always stress is the content of audiobooks is by definition accessible. And, and this trips up a lot of producers because they think, well, it's audio. So we don't really need to worry too much about that. Um, but just because the content is audible doesn't mean <clears throat> that the audiobook itself, itself can be easily found, opened, navigated, listened to, or read in order. And those are the five key things <clears throat> as far as your basic fiction audiobook goes that the new standard addresses. So that, that, that's what I'm really excited about. And that's what I'm um, really anticipating uh, this new standard addressing. Um, another thing on the topic of inline elements, uh, or elements being included in the reading order that are typically found at the end of the book, uh, such as endnotes in that case, or in line such as image descriptions, is skippability. Uh, and <clears throat> just very briefly, this allows reading systems to identify uh, certain types of passages, such as a footnote or an image description, and reading systems that support it can skip over that information to preserve the regular reading order if readers <clears throat> have selected that option or <clears throat> they can uh, read it uh, along with the rest of the narrative even if it's included in a separate track of the narration and then there's an option to skip that if it's something that isn't of interest to that particular reader so it provides a much more uh, fluid and customized reading experience that up until the uh, a few months ago simply has not been available in your typical audiobook. So those are the things that I'm really excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's really interesting to hear that because it's a stark contrast with the kind of books that Leah, you're making. Uh, you're, you know, you're building these features in, uh, which is amazing, uh, but it is sort of a I will say standard audiobook in that it's a folder of mp3s or a folder of audio files. It, that's what as the uh, trade publishers have the power to produce um, in house, where which you may be building those features in, but uh, you're not providing the power and agency to the user to skip that content. If you, there's an inline description, it's there, but now you can't skip it. Exactly. And skippability has been offered in alternate format books ever since their digital inception. But to have that option available in mainstream publications now uh, is really exciting. It, it is one step closer to avoiding this need to produce an alternate format title and instead have it born accessible in the in the audio arena. So it's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, I have to say that sounds amazing. It would definitely be, I think, <laughs> what everyone would ideally want. And it's great that we're moving towards that. Yeah. Um, Pamela, do you have anything from your perspective working on audiobooks uh, for Nels? Uh, I think it, it feels like maybe you bridge the gap a little bit between um, what a trade publisher can produce and, and perhaps formats that are more accessible. Sorry, you're not, you're still muted, Pamela. Thank you. Um, I did a little laugh <laughs> as I was like, oh, am I bridging? Um, trying. Uh, I think, I think, I want to think, I want to highlight clearly what Danny said, that agency is the word that um, to me feels the most important. Is like, how do we um, instill agency in the creations of these audiobooks with the reader so that um, folks can read these books with the same amount of agency that somebody with um, that who's visually reading a print book. So, if you if you if you don't want to read the footnotes, if you want to read the footnotes, if you don't want to look at the picture, if you want to look at the picture, if you <laughs> however you want to do it, if you want to go straight to the end and then back to the front, like that's your right, and it's also your right to um, to uh, to get all the information that is out there. So, I mean, I see this happening so much. Just yesterday, I was working with a narrator who's blind. And uh, he sent me his, um, the book that he was working on, working from to narrate, and it had no images in it. And then when I went to the EPUB that I had to work from, it had images in it, but he didn't even know, you know, and that makes me feel so creeped out that like, that, that, that it wasn't even available for him to, to know that there was something missing. Like, I think that's, it kind of, that's really problematic coming from kind of an agency perspective. Um, but I will say in terms of bridging and, and formats, um, 
what we're what we're doing at Nels right now is looking at it, looking at every book um, individually and assessing what format is going to be the most successful for that book. So, for example, with children's picture books right now, we're um, we're producing an EPUB three an enhanced EPUB so that we can have um, audio, we can have skippable image descriptions, we can have um, text that is a uh, highlight as it's moving along um, and we can still have the um, visual images in the book and that to, that to us is like the most right now is like the most successful format for a children's picture book to be accessible and then for like fiction books for example we're doing both in an mp3 like loose folder as well as always a daisy um Similarly to Danny, I'm really excited about the new audiobook standard and we're like just start trying to stay on top of that and research that and hopefully be producing in that um, because it it's really um, a wonderful move philosophically as well as practically to fuse accessibility and commercial um, access into, into, audio, into audiobook production. This sort of leads into the, the questions that I'd like to continue talking about. And uh, Robert, I'd love to hear from your perspective, since we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, we've mentioned a few things here, uh, ways that, that we are tackling content um, to ensure that we're recording all of the different parts. But um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you uh, you guys over at DNIB always aim to include in an audiobook and um, perhaps how, a little bit about how you tackle descriptions for images as well. Sure, um, I'll do the, what do we include first and then can spin into image description. So we pretty much record, we're gonna include everything that's in the print version of the book. So even things that may not be on the radar um, for aesthetic reasons, like say a table of contents may not be on the radar of a commercial publisher, but then an index which actually has numbers on it. I don't know that it would really work in a commercial audiobook situation because a Daisy book is built with pages. So you can actually use the index in the same way that a print person is using it. Um, but when I say that we're including everything, we're including everything, but it's all in discrete sections that can be skipped over because of the Daisy format. So I don't know if you want to follow up on that, but I could go to the image description. Uh, my my one question uh, would be for a trade publisher or, or a publishing house, um, if they're producing their own audiobooks and they want to make it available to you so that you can um, turn it into a Daisy book mm -hmm. for your patrons, uh, would are there certain things you'd recommend they make sure that they are recording, or do you do you just take on the act of recording um, supplemental material like bibliographies and things like that? Well, we, we wouldn't, uh, for CELA, CELA purchases books from, say, uh, Blackstone, and we do not do remediation on that. We have very limited resources. Uh, we have two studios, but really what you're looking at is uh, six staff members, including myself in Toronto, and uh, two full-time staff members and some contractors in Montreal. Most of our workforce is volunteers. Um, because of the number and COVID is, we'll probably come to that at the end. It's very difficult for us to meet this baseline 600 required books for CELA each year. So when CELA is making a purchase of a Blackstone book, um, our IS department is going to do uh, what I call a daisification, making up a word. Uh, it basically puts a daisy veneer on the existing audio files. Now imagine that the last chapter in the book also included the bibliography, just for some reason. Uh, it's not going to be separated into its own section or anything like that. It's an automated process, and uh, it's just part of the ingestion process that goes on when we take on a, a book from a commercial publisher. At, at this point, we have not been hired to do uh, back matter uh, for a publisher. Uh, we actually, up until really recently, were uh, forced back into doing human narrated back matter. And uh, happily, we're back using a synth engine. Uh, it's a modification of Amazon's Poly. It needs a little bit more work to be able to handle multiple languages. That'll show up in pretty much any history book. 
Um, so it needs a lot of massaging by a human. Um, but the, 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 the time, the years that we actually had humans narrating back matter, I can tell you that this is very taxing on a human narrator. It's exhausting to sit and read, and God help you, web addresses. Um, all of this stuff doesn't flow the way uh, prose or normal sentences flow. Um, I much prefer it to be synthesized, uh, but we, we work with what we got and we try to cover a lot of ground with the resources we have available. I hope that answers. Yeah, it does. Uh, and if you could, uh, yeah, just give us some ideas of best practices and uh, anyone else here, because I know a lot of you guys are experts um, on this subject uh, for image descriptions, uh, replacing images sure. with spoken descriptions. Hugely rich subject. Um, I'm going to dance around a couple of things. I don't want to take up too much time because I really, I think this is something that everybody, uh, every publisher could find a way to incorporate this into their, into their projects. Um, I'll tell you that because our work in, in CNIB long predates uh, the Benetech uh, Diagram Center and the guidelines that are laid out there, that we actually have also uh, our own methods of image description, which we've developed over the course of time. Uh, we incorporate the very useful guidelines from the, from the Diagram Center, uh, but the, there's, a, there's a tonal quality that we try to include. If you're doing an image description for a young person's book, the language really should be tuned to that audience. Um, we, uh, uh, it isn't sparse, but it is, it is elemental. The, the way that we do image description. Um, best of all situations is when you have an author who will work with you, get them aware of the, of the guidelines of uh, image description. And then you actually have the same voice, the author voice that is part of the image descriptions. So uh, I, just to tell you the way we do it, and it probably isn't an easily transmissible over to commercial, if there's a book, and I'd like to use the one, uh, refer to the example that was mentioned previously, where there's a book, there's uh, paragraphs of prose, an image shows up, and I don't know whether it was a decorative, purely decorative image, or it could have been an image conveying meaning, and then it is followed by prose. So when the text is finished, just before the image, we'll go, producer's note, there is an image of uh, a, a boy with a bicycle, and he is looking up at the star. Uh, and then we go end of producer's note. It functions like a bracket. Um, so that's our way of doing it. It is, uh, it is like showing it in an uh, editor's hand, right? So it, it's, it does break the spell. Uh, the same narrator who is doing the book is also reading those. We script all of those things ahead of time. And it, all of that text and scripting is all presented to the, uh, to the reader at the same time. Now, the more ambitious is when you get into things like graphic novels, which are awesome. And I remember in conversation yesterday, there was talk of comic books. Hey, uh, there's a lot of great things that can be done. Um, I'm gonna just tell you a couple of ones. See, with the producer's note move, we wouldn't really use that in a, in a graphic novel. One of the ones that uh, we worked on recently uh, our, our transcription of Laura Dean uh, Keeps Breaking Up With Me, which is a quite popular uh, graphic novel. We did that with multiple voices and that kind of a production, it fits it well. And you can, uh, without having the same person doing a lot of characters, you can, you can make that work very well. You can also have one voice doing the descriptions and other voice voicing the characters. Okay, now there's a, a project that I'm, very excited about that uh, we'll uh, need to deliver for June. Uh, it's a book by Vivian Chong uh, called Dancing at 10, Dancing After 10. And the, the book is uh, very interesting to me because uh, it's, it's a book that's it's getting a lot of kudos too, but uh, Vivian was a, a fine arts student at U of T. Uh, she had a, a terrible reaction to ibuprofen went into a kind of toxic shock and lost her vision. Now her will and her artistic uh, drive uh, led her to overcome uh, these, these, uh, you know, these, these new situations. And she uh, produced this excellent graphic novel with 
uh, the, 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 the work that she was doing with uh, drawing uh, worked over a little bit more by another, another author. Now, she already had an eye to doing this as an audio book. And when she came to us, she had presented us basically a, a script which has image descriptions, but it also has, I don't know how to describe it other than to say it's like uh, an internal voice uh, of the, uh, the, the, you know, the omniscient narrator kind of describing the emotional states of the images. Uh, the version that she originally presented to us also has sound effects and a lot of things I don't know whether we're going to be able to pull off, but it's the kind of thing you go, you want to get really ambitious? This is what you could do. So image description is, I'm saying it's a bit of a frontier, but it's a frontier that's already got roads and buildings and clear, you know, clear landmarks that the rest of us can build around. It sounds like a, a book by book approach is really important in a lot of these different features. Does anyone else have any thoughts about um, images and ways that uh, you've, you've seen uh, images included in in accessible audiobooks? Um, I can speak to it just a little bit. Um, I love working with images. It's like a very nuanced area of audiobooks. Uh, one of the um, one of the things that Robert was saying, the way that we kind of talk about it is that images that are, um, are like part of the primary text in images, like you need those images described to kind of move along. So that would be like children's books, but also in some, um, in nonfiction books and in some um, like adult fiction too, you might see that. And then you have images that are, um, are kind of there as an addition, um, like supplementary. So we, you know, if it's, if it's part of the primary story or part of the primary text, then we would do similar to what uh, Robert's saying, where it would be like producer's note. Um, and then have the description in line. And if it was, um, uh, or like I said, in the children's books, we have a whole different approach. But, and then for um, supplementary information, we'll, this is just an MP3 format, because obviously in DAISY, you have so much more navigation, but to give some navigation to an MP3 format, um, we'll then keep it as close to the chapter as possible. I think this is what you guys do at ECW as well. Like, so right next to chapter one, it'd be like chapter one images, and then you would have the descriptions in there. The only other thing that I really wanted to add um, is that, uh, like Robert said, like working with the author is really ideal and awesome um, to try and keep that tone consistent. And then um, also thinking about working with uh, the author or folks that can represent particular language, cultural language that is um, appropriate to the images. So being careful not to create like a dissonance with the image descriptions and the primary text so that's one of the like of the few projects that we have at Nels working with um, underrepresented voices making sure that when we're producing books by Indigenous authors that the right language is being used to describe those images and if you're not working with the author then you do need to really make the effort to make sure through those communities that the um, that the correct language is being used so it gets complicated and, and, and nuanced for sure but it's definitely um um, an important part of like the the add-ons that we're that we're putting into these in, into these productions you know that are mm -hmm. like you said like the hand that's kind of coming in making sure that hand is like uh you know has has yeah. the right perspective has the right information yeah and this ties into a, a thing that we talk about at the summit a lot which is a born accessible workflow right I, you know if this work is done at the stage of acquisition at the stage of substantive edit um, and the author and editor can work together on this kind of um, perspective of, of the, this experience of the book and considering it right from the start I think that like that's that's one of the ultimate goals. Um, so if there are people who are listening to this, who are working in trade publish publishing houses, you know, bringing this, this stuff back all the way back to the beginning of the process so that it's not left to uh, as an afterthought or as something that happens with a specialist, um, like some of our panelists here, it's something that just is intrinsically built into the book uh, is, is a really wonderful takeaway, I think, from this. Um, if anyone has anything else, I do want to push a little bit into our session time because I think I would really uh, love to hear 
from you guys about challenges, which was the sort of the last thing I wanted to touch on. We did speak about reading systems um, already at the top, um, but if there's any any other sort of, I know that having so many different reading systems uh, that people or listening systems, as we say, that people may be experiencing the book on is, is presents challenges for creating the content, which we've talked about. Um, I wonder if, if anyone has any thoughts on what we can do about that challenge. I think um, one thing is actually, it was one of the thoughts we had when we started working on the audiobook specification was not, was the fragmentation that was taking place at literally every part of the, the ecosystem. Like every publisher had a, had their own workflow for producing their audiobooks, be they be that in-house or with a, a studio. Every distributor had their own method for uh, packaging and distributing and providing metadata for their audiobooks. Every uh, library retailer uh, system, you know, all the overdrives and the Blackstones and Kobos and Audibles of the world, everybody had their own way to do something. And that fell even as far down as listening systems, reading systems, you know, it, you, there's common features, you know, you've got your play pause buttons, but then there's additional features like sleep timers and um, navigation. And it's a lot of, um, but every reading system that I found, every one that I've used, we did a lot of like market research, played around with a lot of reading systems. They all kind of work the same, but it seems to be more driven by, okay, what does users, what do users want and what is everyone else doing? And there, but there's also differences in how they operate, which was very interesting. And so one thing when we worked on the spec is, it's like, well, if we can present a common list of features that this specification enables, that means that a listening system or a user or user agent in the parlance of specification writing, a user agent has a fairly predictable set of things that it needs to know to do. If it if you're providing table of contents, I need to provide a navigation. If you're providing audio, I need to provide play, pause, skip functionality. If I'm providing, if the format's providing text, uh, transcripts or other formats like HTML. I probably need a way to display that. Um, but because that hasn't been present before, every system has kind of come up with its own feature set and or has stolen them from or borrowed or, you know, greatest artist, great artist steal um, from other examples in the market. So what I'm really hoping for is as more people move to this kind of standardized format, we'll see listening agents, like user agents, getting more creative with features and adding new features, but then also those features being duplicated across different systems so that I, I know as a content creator that when I put a transcript in my audiobook or I put endnotes or I put images, I know that a, a reader of mine on Kobo, a reader of mine using Thorium and a reader of mine using Audible are gonna have the exact same experience or pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I mean, in publishing, we know how to do this. We've done it already with EPUB, right? It, it's the same thing, just a different format. Um, yeah, I find it interesting working uh, from uh, on the audio metadata perspective that so many of the vendors that I distribute to don't even want a table of contents. They don't want to know what the names of the chapters are. They just it's just one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and even where you, you can supply a table of contents, very few require it. So uh, it, we in some ways have a long way to go and yet we're making so much progress at the same time. Um, lastly on challenges, I'd love to hear from any of you on the financial challenges and maybe I'll throw this to Leah first uh, to talk about financial challenges from a trade publishing perspective. Yeah, so um, there's always going to be financial challenges when it comes to doing something new, trying to get something going in perhaps, um, like at least from a trade perspective, what is a still developing industry. And so, you know, going to another publisher and saying there's this great new format, uh, well, audiobooks are not new, but they're, you know, it's starting to gain traction in Canada, and you should spend $10,000 on this audiobook. You know, that's a really hard thing to convince a publisher who year to year is just trying to get by. How do you convince them to take that risk? And how do you do it in good conscience? 
um, and not just be trying to to make money until that publisher no longer exists. That no one would do that. Um, not ECW, anyways. Um, and so and so it becomes a matter of you know we have these wonderful opportunities like financial support um, from the government that provide uh, you know for the past uh, it's kind of the timeline's a little messed up, but basically since um, since last year, uh, there's been some funding available to make accessible audiobooks, and that's what has allowed so many Canadian publishers not only to start making their catalog available in audio, but to specifically be doing it with an eye for accessibility and putting the onus on them to report and say, not only did I make an audiobook, which is inherently accessible, but here's how I took that a step further. And I think that's, you know, when we frame challenges from a perspective of not just the challenge, but also like what's the potential solution and how can we make this into a positive or how can we move forward? And speaking also to, um, to, to Wendy's point, um, I think that, uh, you know, from a production perspective, it really is all about communication. And it really is all about like, not keeping it close to the chest, not making it a secret. You know, if I'm talking to a multinational publisher or if I'm talking to an indie press with three employees, I'm going to share the same resources with them and the same amount of information because the more people doing this, the more we can succeed and reduce those financial barriers. Thank you. That's really, a, that's a wonderful way to look at it. <laughs> um, does anyone else want to jump in and talk about financial challenges? I'll chip in. I'm in a different world mm -hmm. than commercial publishing, um, but it's not super different because we still have to uh, we still have to meet our budget. When I mentioned that we CNIB Library is now beyond print, it's a social enterprise now, and our primary client is Sela. Um, but we also uh, have uh, clients that are commercial publishers, and I look at that as multiple win situation because. Um, firstly, we're able to uh, help to guide them in what is usually their, their beginning steps towards making accessible books. I absolutely echo what Adam said in the previous session. Please render us redundant. Um, the move for us to be a social enterprise was so that we could be self-sufficient. And at least in the case of CNIB, CNIB funds could also be used for other things like independent living skills, uh, advocacy. There's so many other ways that this money could be spent. And um, I also see that by the mainstream, including this, you're also increasing your market share. And then the one that I think will appeal to everybody here is uh, recognize that if Canada doesn't do it itself, there won't be as many of these books available uh, on the world market because we're gonna get steamrolled by other, uh, other more aggressive uh, you know, commercial operations. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. That's a great point. Um, we've already pushed over by nine minutes. Does anyone have any concluding, any last thoughts, anything else that they didn't get to say um, today? Um, can I just add a little bit about finances that sure. is maybe like um, maybe interesting for folks that coming from a, like an audio engineering background, I think it's really um, fascinating at how much, how inflated that industry can be because of like a lot of like um, the hold that the tech industry can have over the information that they that they aren't transparent with um, and I, so I would kind of just want to like blow that open a little bit and talk about how um, affordable recording equipment is now and how affordable it is to record in home at like quite a high studio level um, and just to note that we at Nels are recording almost in well we're record, recording entirely from home I'm sending out equipment um small kits that cost um four hundred dollars tops that's including a device to record onto so I'm, you know send or eight hundred dollars including the device or four hundred dollars if not sending out to folks giving them a few training sessions and they're able to record at a studio level with some support from me along the way um I think that's a really cool thing to just kind of blow out um in terms of supporting like small um small publishers in self-producing that this like this this studio world this kind of like Beatles world of the studio environment that doesn't exist anymore equipment is made to be um, equipment is being made to record at home like this microphone that I have here it's just a USB plugged right into my computer that's it that's really easy just plug that baby right in that's a really <laughs> great point and I mean of course this is something that has come up more in the last year uh, mm -hmm. since our previous uh, summit. 
Um, and it, it will continue, of course, now, now that we were pushed in that direction, I think it's of course gonna continue in that direction. Um, okay, if, if anyone, if no one else has any final thoughts, I will wrap it up. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and also to Wendy's cat for coming today and, uh, <laughs> and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, yeah, you guys, uh, just an amazing, amazing group of people here. Um, the session continues uh, until the end of the day, I believe. So uh, the panel portion is over, um, but we can move on now into uh, to talking about the kind of things that uh, we've sort of gotten the ball rolling on here in the panel. Um, and if you have any questions for any of the panelists, I believe they're gonna be in this session for the rest of this, uh, this time block. So thank you again, everyone.